first target, Equido Atierno, also known as the banker of Astok. He's some type of smuggler dealing and trading in human lives. Mostly operating to the east in Anayang, he's suddenly looking to expand his business over into the Gillies territory. A fatal mistake. The Gillies are an ex-military unit that formed a gang after being exiled from their own country. With the Green Party now running everything in Underland, except of course for the six yellow cities, the group of refugees had only two choices. Hide his outlaws in the dense jungles of Anruzaniv, or join the massive corruption that is the GP. Luckily, the Gillies had friends in the new military, so instead of being pushed out, they struck a deal. The Gillies could continue to operate as an underground organization as long as they answered and reported directly to the NY's military. And so, the Gillies established themselves here, using Sikarik as their main base of operations. I met the Gillies during an assignment with my father, and they promised if I ever needed work, they'd pay me well. So here I am. The leaves crack under my boots as I run through the Aluzen undergrowth. With the moon lighting a path, my eyes dilate and focus, adjusting to the darkness. The target is three miles northeast of the main city, holed up in a temporary compound. Three guards, six mercenaries, and the target. Barely arriving yesterday, probably as a scouting unit, they will be joined by a large mob at sunrise. Thanks to me, however, the only thing they'll be arriving to is a pile of corpses. After all, it'd be rude not to give our eager neighbors a proper welcome. I plant my feet in front of me, coming to a complete stop. Glaring down on the harbor, I notice every warehouse is dark and quiet, seemingly empty. Except for one building, still illuminated with electricity. A lonely campfire in a tin forest, betraying its makers and guiding my rifle. Arriving on the east end of the seaport, I overlook the entire boatyard in an abandoned house the people call Rumukai Bebe. Area Sport is the most prominent structure of the coastal city and the entryway into Sikarik. To claim Aluzeniv, the rival gang would first establish themselves in the Federation's most important seaside state, Sagrav, cutting off the Gillies' naval supply line. The port itself consisted of three medium sized berths extending out into the ocean, each around 400 feet in length, two on the north end of the port and one on the south end and a massive 2,000-foot Z-shaped berth on the eastward-most end, enclosing the port almost completely, like a mechanical arm forever reaching out for an unattainable object, shaping the harbor into an uneven pentagon held open for the world's relentless cycle of trade. The largest section of the port was undoubtedly the inland wharf on the westward-most end, providing almost 2,000 feet of docking space and around 500,000 square feet of cargo space. Each field of concrete inside the port was stacked with hundreds of steel containers, every one filled with incoming goods for the Federation. On the West Inland Wharf, a series of 12 warehouses lay still in the dead of night, but only 11 hid underneath its shadow. Peering through my scope, I instantly spot the two men keeping watch over the harbor, still standing just outside the lighted warehouse. Though tagging them from my current position would be easy, I never take any chances. They'll all fall together. Crossing the shaded street, I make my way towards the Z-Berth. Crouched and silent, I scurry over to cover, directly across the port security booth. Skimming over the vacant harbor, I discover all the staff and personnel unexpectedly missing. At a minimum, one security guard should always be on location at any given time, preventing thieves from simply walking out with the facility's cargo. And still, there was no one present but the invading Anayans. Either the port had recently changed its policy, or Danto's new friends had skipped negotiations. At first, the piles of containers acted as perfect cover, completely blocking the guard's view of me. But after reaching the Z-Burst entrance, I find the long concrete pier is almost completely devoid of hiding spaces. Three ships sit anchored to the Z-Burst, each having a football field-sized gap in between them. Thankfully, this is a harbor, and there is a bay of water on all sides. I place my weapon back inside my backpack and seal it all inside a waterproof bag. Vaulting over the burst ridge, I grip the ledge off the pier's east side. For a moment I dangle from the edge, before I release my grip and drop down into the inky waters below. Engulfing me as I sink below its surface, the ocean hugs me tight, its grip strong enough to rip a breath away from my lungs. Cold and dark, night waters always took some getting used to the penetrating torrent of salt and microbes lighting my body in eager packs. Rising up out of the bay's embrace, I take a breath and start for the north end of the port. 
swimming through the tainted jet pool of seawater, cutting through a glistening ocean of moonlight. Duplicating the sky above in a wavy mirror, the stars dance in an everlasting gravitational waltz, pulled back and forth by their planetary overseers. I never look at things this way unless I'm working. The careful steps towards a perfect assassination must get me sentimental. Reaching the middle section of the Z-Birth, I spot a column of rusted brown bars. Fashioned like a ladder, they run up the side of the pier seawall. Climbing up, thousands of water droplets plunge back into their mother's sodden womb as I ascend and peek over the wall's edge. Ten thousand tons of welded metal lies in front of me, covering me completely. Now concealed, I jump up and rush over to the north end of the cargo ship. Glancing over the north side of the vessel, I learn that the front of the occupied warehouse is almost completely lined up with my position. I'm approximately 700 feet from the group of men in the warehouse, with only the shipping bay and humid air separating me from my targets. When I engage them, even if they discern my position, their medium-range rifles won't be able to pin me accurately from this distance. Their only hopes of reaching me quickly being the wide open container field or the murky bay below. Immediately I take my carbon black AMSR-6 out of my watertight bag and unfold it. I have 7 rounds per magazine counting the chamber's metallic guest. Each cartridge is a 50 caliber armor piercer, though I only see the outside guards wearing vests. Mirrored electrons bounce off my scope's lenses, absorbed by my antenna as I peer through magnification's gift. I observe the game through a single broad rectangular casement window and a slightly open pale blue hinged door on the warehouse's left arm. Both security guards still stand outside the warehouse room, though in my new position I can now discern their companions as well. Three shabby dark-skinned men sit at a table, watching the mounted television on the north wall of the office. I don't see any of them wearing vests, and they're dressed too lightly to be concealing armor. They're less professional than the armored security, but more heavily armed. Each man carrying an automatic Talash 1936 or an Amarok Select version 3. While the guards only carry some machine guns like the Military Fabric Select version 3 or a Nakla version 35. The armored men must be a Nyan cartel, while the dingy looking men must be hired help. Situated in the office's northeastern corner, a restroom lies. Black shadows cut the thin glow of light into pieces around its door's visible border, confirming another soul's location. Two dark green motor-powered skiffs sway in the bay's rocking waters, both tied to the inland dock, each one of them barren, save for the few black bags on board. That leaves four bodies outside my field of view. Nevertheless, my senses know more lie hidden behind the warehouse walls. I just had to set the rat's nest on fire. 700 feet of windless air bears its challenge in front of me, so I adjust accordingly. Every hundred feet past the first, I raise my rectangle a quarter of an inch, countering gravity's constant pull. Picking my first target, my trained muscles hold the sway of imperfection at bay for a moment, and as the emerald crosshairs overlap with my selected victim, I fire. The metal fragment pierces the power line transformer supplying power to each of the surrounding warehouses. Exploding in expulsions of flaming arrows and crazed energy caused by the electrical transfer device's short circuit, the elongated steel cube soars high into the air. Flashed by an erupting conflagration, the entire inland wharf is bathed in a shower of electrons born from the discharged electrical sparks. Then the collagenosity born from the sun's daily slumber envelops the port once more. I lower my scope back down, observing my target's reaction to the sudden blast of hot metal on swift fire. In situations like this, people always proceed in one of two ways. Either they counter the attacker, running outside and returning fire in a haste fright, or they take cover and regroup, planning a strategic answer to the unexpected gunfire. The former reserved for wannabe gunfighters, lost in a fantasy of glory. Though this is a rare breed, most men fall in the latter category, where fear's icy grip seizes their throats, choking their minds with grim realizations. As expected, the two armored guards sprint towards the door of the now dim office. As they do, I see something that plasters a wide grin across my face. Zooming in on the room's doorknob, I can see the men inside have actually locked the office, shutting their own guards out. Snickering with glee at the gang's trepidation, I aim for the door's lock and clamp down on the trigger. The entire handle flies clean off in a spud of grinding alloys, causing the old door to slowly creak open. One of the guards reaches the open entrance and hurls himself at it. He slams against the blue steel, but it doesn't swing open. 
The other guard joins him, and they both throw their bodies against the blocked passageway. Though it moves a small amount, the aperture stands firm, a slit of space separating the frightened guards from the office's safe walls. Something or someone is blocking their entrance, so I decide to help them out. The bullet cuts through the door as if the gateway was made of tenderly cooked flesh, burying its steel frame deep into a body on the aggression's other side. His scream echoes throughout the favela streets, but barely rouses the night's usual routine. The man cries out, his shabby figure falling over by the window. As he does, I see several scalps scurry away from the bash doorway, back towards the right side of the room. Outside, the cartel security guards throw themselves one last time against the door. Steel layered wood burst open, revealing two figures I couldn't see before. Forward flowing seconds abate their normal current as my eyes fall upon Iquido. Clothed in a loud nine shirt, sewn with segregated upturned triangles of statesman like design. He might as well be dressed in magnetic cotton with a bullseye painted on his forehead. Centering my target's head perfectly in between my crosshairs, I am an inch and a half above him. My finger begins to contract, pressing the trigger back in what seems like an eternity. Sonnets of creaking metal fills my ears as the welded steel grinds against itself under compulsion. As the propelling device activates, 200 decibels of choice ringing bores into the four rear sections of my skull. Feeling the gunpowder burn as the detonating black dust blasts the bullet forward, I instinctively grip my weapon tighter. When I was a boy, the recoil proved too much for my undeveloped flesh trust, and I almost always miss my target. Now the only part of the gun that moves is the expelled bullet casing. As the iron projectile departs from the long barrel at 4,000 feet per second, a firm force pulls me forward along with death's touch. I am the gun, the bullet the invisible ray of insinuation casts from my fingertips. Simple gestures of road direct my decision, and annihilation follows suit. Floored steel cuts through the bay's humid atmosphere at over five times the speed of sound. As the red flush shell tears through the black gloom, so do I. Hearing the deafening whistle of the boiling hot stainless alloy fly through the air, the pounding pulse in my tense blood-filled muscles slowly relaxes. This is the only time I can say I am truly at peace. Reality is stretched and heaved around, my sight bouncing in a ray vibrating storm of unfocused vision. Everything around me blurs, tunneling into a tube of images. Only the gleaming pellet erupting from a hollow steel cylinder in a fire cream flower is clear to me now. Almost ferromagnetically compelled, my perceivable being is launched into the two inch sleek cone of gold ammunition. Loose mental bonds break away from their natural tenements, and I enter the bullet. Crossing the black bay waters, I scour at my wavy reflection, admire my exquisite contour and make. Soon the water ends, solid concrete pace replacing the chromium waves. Turning my attention forwards, I know that I've reached the back of a toiling security guard. Breaking through his vest and skin, I pass effortlessly through his body, his opening organs and tissues emitting sloppy wet belches as I gorge through them. Emerging out his front shoulder covered in pieces of muscle, tendons, and blood, my steel frame explodes outwards in a red flower of torn human flesh. I continue onwards towards the second guard at half my initial velocity, flying towards the man as he hastily enters the darkroom and ducks for cover. I enter his mind. He wears no helmet, his only protection against me being his fragile skull. Lucky me. The back of his cranium cracks into four pieces and caves in, weak bone welcoming my entrance through its coral vertex shell. I pass through his walls of neural tissue, like a child paddling through a pool of red wine. As I spurt out just above the man's right sphenoid bone, his crown bursts open, similar to an old dam no longer able to hold back its waters. Launch further still, my objective draws closer, though my pride instigated by the phenomenal flight prompts me to turn my sight back towards my grisly work. Behind me, the guard's face is altered into a pouring fountain of blood and brains, its shape resembling a pouncing beast burying its teeth before devouring its prey. A great wave of premonition crawls over my smooth surface, jittery currents of organic energy inciting me to revert my interest. Swinging my attention forward, I'm almost startled by my target's face merely inches away from my blood-soaked chassis. Equito's face is blank with disconcern, as if the sudden gunfire shocked them into a dream state. But his eyes couldn't be more awake, their glossy, bulging frames drawing me in. 
irises crushing pupils. Each silver string of color squirms in awareness as cessation's arrival. Inch by inch I draw ever closer, now mere centimeters away from his wrinkled nose. Closing my mortal eye, I feel the soft skin give way to the crackle of bone. I pass through, bursting out of his mind in an ocean of red and black, and then I hit the wall. <laughs>